Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have a great show for you tonight. I love this guest, Kevin Randall. He's been on many times. And I often go to Kevin's blogs um, when I want to, you know, look things over and like something's new to me or whatever, and I want to check it out. And I often uh, go there and a uh, different perspective. And it's uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And so we're going to be talking about a couple of different things. And what I did tell uh, Kevin, this is uh, what I did tell Kevin is that I didn't want to talk about ahead of time his opinion on the late breaking news. I wanted to talk about it fresh uh, as soon as he's on the show. So we're going to do that. Our our uh, blog this week by Kevin Lear is part two of Did Einstein Inspect a Crashed UFO and Aliens at Roswell, part two. And next week, um, he's going to have the final uh, version of that, the final segment. And that is going to be about a tape uh, that is very interesting. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying that he's thinking or that any one of us are thinking that that really happened. It's just a rumor that's been going around. Some of the people that I've had out there and had other rumors started or things that weren't so accurate may have been involved in starting that. So I don't know what's going on. And uh, so the final uh, segment of that will be next week. Uh, Kevin Randall has, I can't remember how many, I think it's a hundred books or more. He's written it, something like that. A uh, very prolific author. And he has a uh, an updated version of his 2000 uh, book. And it's about UFOs over Washington, D.C. They happened back in 1952. And we'll be dis discussing that as well. And thank you, all the people that support the show. Anyone can do that. The information's on our website, podcastufo.com. And here we go with Kevin. Welcome, Kevin. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here once again. That's right. I think the last time you were on, wasn't it my 10th anniversary? So it's been a little while. It's been a while, but there's been a lot of stuff going on in my life. I guess so. oh, Taking yeah, me out right. of the group periodically. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But welcome back. And uh, so, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, uh, that you and I have not discussed your thoughts on the whistleblower. And I have no idea what you think. I do tell people a lot of times that, you know, you really take a uh, perspective of uh, clarity. And also, you're very cautious when you look at it, a lot of things. And someone wrote me the other day, like um, kind of in, I don't want to say kind of, they were a little upset at something I said during the show, perhaps. Um, and they said, well, you should get Kevin Randall on to talk about Roswell. And I said, well, you don't really know what Kevin's latest view on Roswell is. So maybe we'll ask, I'll ask you that question. Oh, I've pretty well, uh explained my views on Roswell in the last few months. I did a book called, of course, Roswell in the 21st Century, which looked at it with lots and lots of footnotes and where all the information came from. And then I did another book called Understanding Roswell, which kind of modified the, the first book and I think tempered my, uh, I, I guess, my unhappiness with where the Roswell case had gone when I wrote uh, um, Roswell in the 21st century, people thought I was repudiating the Roswell case, and it really wasn't that. I was merely saying that the data that we had, the information that we had, the um, witnesses, the, the documentation was not as robust as it had been 10 or 15 years earlier because we'd learned some of the witnesses were less than candid with us. And there were other people interjecting themselves into the case that made it uh, or, or took us in directions we didn't need to go. But what I was really saying, we just did where I once was absolutely convinced it was extraterrestrial, I had taken a step back from that and said, well, the the evidence doesn't prove the extraterrestrial. I tilt in that direction because when you look for the explanation of what fell in Roswell, there's nothing terrestrial that you can find. Everything's been eliminated. And then do you automatically go to the extraterrestrial? And is that the proper way, way to do this? And, and I was saying, no, I want something a little more concrete than just this leap of logic. We cannot find an explanation here on Earth. Therefore, it must be. And I'm, I'm thinking there may be something, and I don't know what it would be, and I don't know why it's to be classified some 75 years later, but right. there's 
there may be something that was going on in Roswell that we didn't know about that would explain it completely and totally, unlike the nonsensical Project Mogul explanation they came up with. Right. But yeah. I don't know what that would be, and I don't know why it would still be classified, and I don't know why the Air Force wouldn't have trotted that out in 1995. So we all could have said, well, yeah, there you go, we're done. Uh, so I look at all of that stuff. I look at the people who were involved in it, the people we can put there in Roswell at the time, what their backgrounds were, what we know about them, um, what they were able to tell us. And I, I look at that and I say, well, I do not have an explanation for what fell. We all agree something fell. I Now I lean toward the extraterrestrial on it, but it's not quite as adamant as it was 25 years ago based on the continued research. Yeah. You know, it's uh, when something continues on as long as this, it's so hard to separate the myths that have been repeated over and over again and printed over and over again or blogged over and over again or talked about on TV over and over again from what really actually happened back at that time because it, it takes on a life of its own. You know, um, that's coming up. The big yearly event is coming up. And this was one time I was actually thinking of going and then something happened to come up and I can't make it. Uh, have you ever actually been to that event? Oh, many times. Oh, of course you would be, because you wrote I, the uh, book. In fact, I was invited to be there this year, but given my circumstances, I, I couldn't commit sure. at a proper yeah. time. Um, I could have gone. It turned out I could have gone, but I couldn't commit at that time to it. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't think that was right to commit to something and say, and, and at the last minute, say, oh, well, I can't be there. Yes. But I have been there a, a number of times, including the big one in 1997. Um, and uh, I've been back there several times since then. So, yeah, I've been to the event. The problem I have with the event, and it's nothing against people at Roswell because, I mean, they've turned it into more of a festival than yeah. a symposium, I guess you'd say. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, here's something that happened in their area, and they're kind of celebrating it. And, of course, they're going to exploit it as much as they can, just as uh, uh, other places exploit what happened around their cities or their towns in the past. So I don't, I don't mind that. It's just, um, I, I think the seriousness sometimes get lost in the festival aspect of it. They put on a lot of programs. They bring in a lot of speakers. Um, I know Don's going to be there. Don Schmidt's going to be there. I think Travis yep. Walton's going to be there again and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, what does Travis Walton have to do with the Roswell UFO crash? Well, really nothing at all other than his UFO sighting. Yes. So, but yeah. they're, they're wanting to bring in people who um, have some experiences with UFOs and that sort of thing. And I don't have a problem with that. I just look at it. We have to look at it from that point of view. And, and there's a lot of things that go on um, there. People misunderstand stuff that's said and uh, carry on with that. And that blows up into uh, a new part of the myth that really shouldn't be there. It should have been eliminated a long time ago, but uh, we have to deal with it. I just saw a documentary that was, I guess it was made in 2019. I was, do, I was doing uh, channel surfing and uh, what I call a video lap, by the way. And I um, came across a program where they were doing the Roswell thing and talking about this and they were bringing in the MJ-12 documents and yeah. reading them as if they were legitimate. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's certainly not helpful. I think the majority of the UFO researchers the vast majority of UFO researchers understand the MJ-12 documents are fake. And yet this documentary is presenting, well, the document said this, we don't care, It somebody made it up. But that, right. that stuff leads us in a wrong direction and I don't know how much, how many resources were expended in the attempt to validate the MJ-12 documents, which we had to do when the documents were presented, we had to validate them, we had to vet the documents. Are they authentic? And if they are authentic, that's great, but in the end of the investigations, uh, I, I, we found the poison pills, and we know how it was done. Um, there was a, a movie uh, a number of years ago called Truth, and it was about Dan Rather and the George um, W. Bush National Guard stuff, and they had the documents and all of that stuff, and they were talking about the documents. And at the end of the movie, the reporter, I think it was Mary Mapes, was saying to them, the person who, if these were fake, the person who faked them had to have an intimate knowledge of the workings of the Texas Air National Guard back in that time frame, would have had to study all of this stuff. And I'm thinking, no, 
All they needed was some copies of documents that, that, that they could retype or add lines to or do things about that they um, they wanted to move us in that direction. That's what happened with MJ-12. It wasn't somebody who had an intimate knowledge of some of these things. It was somebody who could uh, copy documents and add a line about MJ-12 here or uh, a message about MJ-12 there. And the documents are authentic up to the point where you get that. And if somebody's retyping it, when you get to the original document, the source document, you see something's been added. So uh, that does not help uh, UFO research whatsoever. But my point simply is in today's world, uh, 2023, um, I, the, the, to me, the, the Roswell case is not as robust as it had been because of some of these paths we've gone down. But as I say, I still toward, tilt toward the extraterrestrial. Yes. Getting back to the MJ-12, I remember having discussions with Stanton Friedman, basically giving him my opinion of when, as an appraiser of antiques and art and documents, when I appraise a collection and I find something that's fake in the mix, all of a sudden I want to look at everything carefully and most likely discount the entire collection a lot of times. But Stanton would say, and he's, and I kind of said that to him, he didn't really get where I was going uh, because he, he would say that some of them were authentic. And I know he did a ton of research, but I mean, my point is why would some of them be authentic and others not? You know, it's either the whole thing or one way or the other. It has to be. Well, in the world of intelligence, if you find out something has been compromised by, by, by enemy spies, uh, what you do is create a bunch of other documents and shove it into the pipeline so that you can discredit the first batch of documents. I see. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but the problem with, I think the, the, the problem with the MJ-12 documents, the best of the documents is the Eisenhower briefing document. And there's a poison, there's a number of poison pills in there. But it's clear to me that that document was created in 1985. Hmm. Not 1980, 19, 1952 is, is claimed for a briefing to President-elect Eisenhower. And one of the things I couldn't get Stan to understand is if I'm, if I'm creating a document to brief the president or the president-elect, I'm going to include all the information. And the MJ-12 document eliminates the Plains of St. Augustine crash. And I don't understand why that wouldn't have been there. And in fact, mm. in the beginning, that was the place you needed to go because that was where um, the original story talked about bodies. At Roswell, there wasn't an original story talking about bodies. We got to that point later, but there was Plains of St. Augustine. So that would be the more important crash. And Stan told me that uh, he thought that because that there were bodies there, that information was withheld from the president. I said, that makes no sense to me. And, mm. and I... I and I, I hesitate to say I worked with Carl Flock um, on a, an investigation of the Barney Barnett tale. And the Plains of Santa Augustine really boils down to a single witness, Barney Barnett. And there was really nothing to connect it to the Roswell crash in 1947 other than what his boss said. Well, I think it was in the time of 1947, but his boss's memory wasn't very good at that point. But um, I, you know, I was talking to Stan. I said there was no crash in the Plains. He said, well, prove it to me. So I sent him a copy of the MJ-12 document. John, that was a great joke because it's not mentioned there, mm. but he didn't appreciate it. So there you go. But I think that, you know, that's that's one of the problems we run into is with MJ-12. I think that the original documents they're from an anonymous source. Well, you can't vet them right. that way. They, we yeah. got photo, we got photographs of them, not the original documents. So you right. can't test yeah. the ink. You can't test the paper. You can't yeah. do this. You can't do that. All you can do is look at what's in the documents and, and some of the information in the documents is anachronistic. Um, they, they was talking about um, the, well, the, the uh, El, El Indio Guerrero, El Indio Guerrero, yeah, which is really the Del Rio crash, which uh, was originally talked about, I think in 1968 by Robert Willingham. And he was talking about how it was, uh, it happened in 1948. And then he said, well, it happened in 1950. And when I talked to Willingham, he said, well, it was the mid 1950s. Well, it was the mid 1950s. It couldn't be in the Eisenhower briefing document because it hadn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. But of course the Willingham story turned out to be a complete and total hoax. And, and, and yet um, there's mention of it in the Eisenhower briefing document because at the time the documents were created, there was a belief among the 
creators that the Del Rio, the El Indio Guerrero crash was legitimate. They, that was what we all believed in the 19, 1985. We had an affidavit from an Air Force colonel for crying out loud. Turned out the guy wasn't an Air Force colonel, so the affidavit was virtually worthless. Uh -huh. But at the time, we all believed, and I did a book in uh, the mid-1990s called uh, History of UFO Crashes, where I talked about um, that craft and, and Robert Willingham's affidavit and that sort of thing. When I updated that to crash when UFOs fall from the sky, because now we have access to the Internet, you can do all this stuff from your, from your home. I thought I'd see what was new about it, and I learned that Willingham was out with a new tale. What he said in 1960, I actually found the 1968 reference to it in Skylook magazine, which was the MUFON journal before it was the MUFON journal. I found his original story, and it does not match at all what he said in uh, later in 1950, uh, later to Todd Zeckel in the 1970s, and what he later said at the Center for UFO Studies and signed his affidavit. But he was talking about in 1948 how he was flying an F-94 fighter. Um, but in 1948, the F-94 didn't exist. He was talking how the radar, the dew line had uh, keyed them to this intruder. Uh, of course, the dew line didn't exist in 1948. And once he found all this stuff out, then he shifted the dates. So, uh, but, but the point simply is in, in the mid-1980s when the Eisenhower briefing document was created, there was a great deal of belief in the UFO community that the Dale Real crash was legitimate. And they just switched the dates, they switched some things around and tried to make it more consistent with what we could learn through history. Hmm. Wow, interesting. All right, well, let's go to it. What do you think about the whole David Grush whistleblower situation? I'm, I'm very worried about it. Um, I actually talked to Jerry Clark about that, uh, talked to him, I emailed, we emailed back and forth about it. He said we need to be cautious because we don't have all the information and we shouldn't be really uh, drawing solid conclusions prior, before, prior to getting all the information. But there are some red flags that we need to be aware of. Grush said that um, he, he won't reveal his sources. Who told him this stuff? Uh, he says he has documentation, but they're still classified and he can't let them out. Excuse me, you've already blown the whistle on this. You know, letting out the documents is not going to harm you any more than it's, you're already harmed. No, is that so? So he can take classified documents now and release them and he can't get... He supposedly has classified documents. I don't know why he would have them. If they And if they were once classified and then declassified, well, then there's really no problem. Right. But if they're still classified and he has possession of them, then then he's in violation of any number of regulations. Um, but that's that's my understanding. And that's what he said. Well, I have these documents. I haven't been given permission to release them. Yet, I guess is what he says. Oh, I didn't hear him actually say that phrase. He said that during the long interview. Uh, he has made that comment elsewhere. I think mm. he's talked about how he is try. He, he needs the permission to release the documents. But we don't. But but the, the point simply is he hasn't released them. Well, here's here's something here, a, a little by Bo here. He testified to Congress. And just to make the point, if he was under oath and he was lying, he would his butt would be in big trouble. If he truly believed what he said and it was untrue, meaning he didn't realize it was untrue, then he's not lying. He's merely carrying misinformation to its source. I mean, there's a, a, a fine line you walk there between lying and repeating information you believe to be the truth. So uh, if he truly believes this stuff, and I get the impression he truly believes what he's saying there, I'm just worried about the sources of that information. And and, and, and it would have to be, um, I, I'm just thinking, and, and I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying. It was one of the questions I asked Ralph Blumenthal when I had him on. Um, and it just seems like it would be have to be so involved with so many people, apparently, not that I know for sure, but it would just seem like it would be such an elaborate thing. And why would they why would they do that? In your opinion? Why, why would who do what? Why would why would they be feeding him disinformation? I don't think no, I don't think it's disinformation. What I understand. And please, this is my understanding, and I've, I've, I haven't been really called out on any of this yet. 
um, he, he would be talking to friends and they would tell him stuff about these sorts of things. The problem I have with this, if you are involved with classified materials, especially highly classified top secret materials, you do not discuss it with those who are not cleared to hear it. And you must assume that everybody around you um, who is not involved in this particular project is not cleared to hear it. So I don't know why they're bringing him these tales unless it's unclassified material. And if it's unclassified material, then it's not that important because we have an awful lot of unclassified material out there floating around about UFO crashes and MJ-12 and documentation and all kinds of other things. So I worry about, I worry about that. I worry about the claim that um, they would bring him or he would see these things that are, highly classified. And yeah, people make mistakes and people reveal classified material by mistake all the time. Uh, I've been out all the time, but periodically, I know, was it um, Mick George Bundy, who was a high ranking member of the Johnson administration, I believe, hmm. inadvertently revealed a code word to reporters. He had a document in his hand with the code word on it, you know, say top secret and it would give the code word. And they got photographs of that. So they realized what the code word was. So he inadvertently released the code word, which was classified in, in and of itself. So that these sorts of mistakes are made. But you don't generally get into gossip with people who are not cleared to hear the information. So I, I don't understand this at all. But he did say a couple of things in the long form interview that was interesting. He talked about this 19... 33 crash in Italy, which I'd never heard of. And I've been researching UFO crashes for yeah, literally I decades. Magenta, I believe, or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, but but uh, that case was debunked by Italian researchers two decades ago. And yet he's talking about this case from Italy in 1933, where um, the fascist Mussolini recovered parts of a flying saucer or a mostly intact saucer and he moved it to an airfield brought the pope into it pope pius the oh gosh 12th pope pius some number uh into it and the pope was worried about the fascists having this information and leaked it to the americans and once the war was over we recovered the the debris and there were documents supposedly released in relation to this she, she, uh, this this um, stuff and and um, what happened is they did an investigation into the documentation and it's the same thing we had with the MJ12 they cannot bet any of the sources they don't know what the sources are hmm. the, the claim sources an archive that supposedly released some of the documents doesn't exist. And we just got all this, I just got all this information in the last week and I'm completing a, a posting for my blog that outlines this. But when we look at that sort of information, so I would assume, I would believe that the people who were talking about this 1933 crash in the hearing, in the range of crash would have known all aspects of it. I think Timothy Good talked about it in one of his books. Um, and there were a number of articles published 20 years ago. And I have access to the articles that are published in Italian. And, and just Friday, no, no, Sunday, just Sunday, I got uh, copies of the articles translated into, into English from, from our, uh, our colleagues in Italy. Um, uh, Eduardo Russo, I think, provided, provided them to us. And so I put it together a long form about this crash. But if Crush believes this crash really took place and he related this to Congress, well, he's not lying. He believes it to be a real thing and he's not fully aware of all the other things. If you look up the 1933 crash, Italian crash on the Internet, you don't get much in the way of information. There's not a lot of information out there in the American environment. Mm -hmm. But um, a number of the um, groups I, have, I belong to and subscribe to, uh, have access to people all around the world, and uh, they just said this thing was this thing was um, exposed more than two decades ago. So it, it makes you wonder about the credibility of his of his information. And then the other thing I heard, and I have not been able to verify this yet, so I don't know if it's true or not that he was involved in some fashion at Skinwalker Ranch. 
And Jerry cautioned me, well, don't don't smear him with this idea he was involved in Skinwalker Ranch. And I'm saying the point is not that he was there and he may have been there for a couple of days. It's the people who were there that he would have come in contact to with who may have fed him some of this other information. People who allegedly have high government positions talking about things. Uh, one of them would have been Eric Davis, who is on the record. And I heard him, uh, I don't know if it was on Coast to Coast or one of the other shows, talking about the, how the Del Rio crash was real. And I'm thinking, no, it's not. And I've known that for literally 15 years, uh, based on my research and the, and the disintegration of the um, tales told by Robert Willingham. Who claimed, who claimed he was an Air Force fighter pilot, that he um, had ra risen to colonel in the Air Force. Uh, I got his military records. He had risen to the rank of E-4, rather low-ranking enlisted man. He is technically, was a technically a um, veteran of World War II. We entered the service in December of 1945. The war was not declared over officially until the middle of 1946. The shooting had ended, obviously, in September of 45. So Willingham is, was technically a uh, veteran of World War II. He was on duty from uh, December of 1945 through January of 1947, 13 months, was an E-4. Claimed he went to flight school, claimed he was a fighter pilot, claimed he was promoted to full colonel by Lyndon Johnson, which the way he tells it was a story right out of Webb Griffin's um, I don't know. I, I think it was the um, Brotherhood of War Stories books that he wrote where a guy got promoted by presidential directive. And, and so he, uh, Willingham was claiming that, that Lyndon Johnson had done that in 1976. Of course, Johnson wasn't the president. He died in January. So it's very unlikely that happened. Um, claimed he was badly wounded in Korea. So they took him out of fighters. He couldn't fly fighters in the um, the active forces anymore, but he went into the Air Force Reserve and flew fighters. And I have a lot of friends in the Air Guard, and I asked him about that. And he said, no, the problem with um, if you're disqualified from flying fighters, it's because but one of the reasons might be that you cannot withstand the uh, forces of the ejection if something goes wrong and you have to eject. And from what Willingham was talking about, those forces would have come into play. Uh, so he had, he had left the active force and joined the reserve so he can continue to fly fighters untrue. The one thing that I point out, which my experience helps with, is I know of no military pilot who has ever gotten an FAA pilot's license who did not get a commercial license. And I say that because according to the FAA regulations, and I, I use this regulation to my, my benefit, if you went to a military flight school and graduated from that military flight school, and you had more than 200 hours of flight time. And when I graduated from flight school, we had 210 hours. Um, you could go to the FAA, take a 50 question test and you'd be issued a commercial pilot's license. Willingham had a private pilot's license, not as hmm. important as a commercial license. Very I didn't cool. get mine until I got back from Vietnam and I had like 1200 hours of flight time or more than that, uh, 1100 in combat flight time. So, wow. Uh, you know, I got back. I, I, I took the test. I didn't pass with a really high grade, but who cares? Because I passed, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to take it again to raise the grade. I got my commercial pilot's license, but I know of no military pilot who didn't, who took the test and took the time to do that, got a private pilot's license. But that was all that Willingham had was a private pilot's license. That argues against what he said. I, this is a long involved way of, of, of looking at the vetting process. And, and, and I guess we can get back to Eric Davis, who may have been at the Skin Rocker Ranch, and it may be Davis who talked to Crush about the Del Rio crash. If he, in fact, talked about the Del Rio crash, he won't tell us what crashes um, he knows about other than Roswell and this 1933 crash in Italy. And I have speculated based on this rumor the uh, suggestion that that crush had been to skinwalker ranch and, and i know who was there and it, it could put him in touch with some of the people whose stories we have had a chance to vet and they're, they're not all that great so i worry about that and that raises red flags with me does that mean that crush is not telling the truth no it means that there are some problems here which we could we could remedy easily if he would provide us with some of the sources who told you this stuff 
do you have any of the documentation that goes with it? Well, supposedly, uh, supposedly, there is someone that's going to uh, also join, uh, I don't know, as a witness or a whistleblower that was more involved. Now, I don't know if that's just a rumor I've heard. I don't know for sure. But that would be key to, to cracking this whole thing open. If that, that would be very important. But at this point, that hasn't happened. So we can't say, well, there's going to be there's more more whistleblowers coming. But we've been through this many, many times. We, we, we went through this with the MJ-12 documents, for crying out loud. Here, here's these documents. We got them from the government. And, and the news media spent time investigating those and, and talking to the people who had them and all of this sort of thing. And it all blew up. The alien autopsy. Oh, yes. We had a big press conference in, in London uh, <laughs> announcing these films and yeah. showing a little bit of the footage. And we were talking about how there were two and a half hours of footage and Truman seen walking the crash site with cranes in the background and all of this stuff. And when we get down to it, it's crap. Uh, we had the Roswell slides, what went on for months. You know, yep. Here's this picture, and we, 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 it, this blurred picture we, we got, and we finally got a decent copy of the picture. We were able to identify exactly where it was and what it was in 48 hours. I remember that. I was there right at the, the, the whole, I was involved in that whole thing, and right while that was happening. And I remember I was so disappointed when I saw it, when that image popped up. I, I just couldn't believe it. Not that I knew exactly that it was for sure anything, but it certainly wasn't, you know, it certainly looked like a mummy to me. What you know, happened? What not happened? like I'm a specialist or anything, but, you know, I mean. After it, just, after it came out and Tom Carey was talking about photographs, you know, Tom Carey kind of released this. And so I, I'm thinking, well, if it's not a real alien, where would they get the picture? What would be the picture of? The picture was clearly taken in 1948. The picture was clearly taken. Yeah, that's that's the. That's movie. a picture. It's small, but there it is. Yeah. Um, picture was the film. The, the slide film was clearly from the right time frame. The the mounting was clearly the right time frame. Um, the, the the testing suggests it was 1948. So where would somebody in 1948 get something like this? And I thought, well, science fiction movies. But I've got a a, a couple of nice resources on science fiction films, and. In the 1940s, when they had aliens, they were always humans in bizarre costumes. I mean, dressed strangely, but they were clearly human. There was nothing like that. And so I said to Tom uh, before the big, big reveal, I said, could it be a mummy? And he said, no, we've looked for no mummies and we, we, we couldn't find one that matches. And um, but but. Uh, within hours of getting a good quality copy of oh the placard, there was a placard on it in front of the, the case, there was a little, little placard that couldn't be read because it was blurred. And I, right. I, yeah. I think what happened was um, the people who owned the um, slide, when they when they put out the um, original story, they kind of blurred that out so you couldn't read it. But the moment, the moment, well, not the moment, but the minute they got a better, better image of the um, placard, it became clear what it was. Yeah, and within, a, within a few hours. I, I, 48 hours, I think it, was, it took them to get that far. 48 hours to get it deblurred to the point where they could read the whole thing and realize what was going on. And then they found the uh, archaeological evidence from the late 19th century where the where the poor unfortunate child had been discovered. The body yes. of the child had been discovered and that sort of thing. I know, and, and when you see the whole thing, it's clearly a museum setting. It's not what you would, oh, there you go. Mummified body of a two-year-old boy. There you go, right there. Yeah, and that gave the whole thing away. Um, yeah, but but at that point we had we had the experts coming out saying, well, this, that, and the other thing. Like, uh, anthropologists uh, saying, yeah, it says what they had was it doesn't look like it's human, and it's, the arms are not quite right, or the hands are wrong, or there's something wrong with that. Uh, this, this the the whole thing. But the point is, we had that kind of information and that kind of speculation going on prior to the discovery of the placard or the reading of the placard. And once that was out, it collapsed. I mean, I think Tom held on to the idea it might not be a mummy for quite a while uh, after. Yes, it was he out. did. Yes, because yeah. I, I tried to talk to him, oh, I don't know, several months, maybe even six months afterwards, and said something about, have you changed your thoughts? 
and he was standing standing with it still. But but Don Don pretty much well Don called me and right apologized. Away. Don yeah. called me right away and said, "What do I do?" Hmm. And I said, "Admit admit the truth. You're duped. Apologize for your role in this thing." But Tom Tom wanted to. Tom just really believed in it. I I had Tom on on my uh, my radio show a year or two later. Yeah. And and I, I told him, you know, we'll just we'll talk about UFOs and what you're doing. And he said, well, everything's up to up for grabs. And so we talked a little bit about the um, about the Roswell slides. And uh, I, he'd pretty much come around to the idea that well, you know, it's really not an alien creature. So. Yeah. But but the point simply is we we've, we've gone through this before so now we're at the beginning of of this process, and we have a guy telling stories but he's not provided us with much of anything, other than a reference to a crash in Italy that apparently is a hoax, and and um, you know my speculations on if he was at Skinwalker Ranch. He would have come into contact with these people. Some of the names that have been associated with this are, are Christopher Mellon, I think, has been involved uh, in some fashion in this and um, things like that. But these would be the people he's talking talking to. And unless we get somebody who can, uh, who's disassociated with some of the other aspects of this and talk about it in the um, sort of in a pristine way, uh, I, I just feel it's not going to go very well. You know, and I, 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 I'm with Jerry Clark on this. We don't have all the information yet. We're still waiting for that information. But it's being kind of dribbled out the way it was with the Roswell slides, the way it was with the alien autopsy, the way it was with the MJ-12 documents. I mean, as just three examples of, of this. Or we or we could go the other way and say, or the way it was dribbled out with the Project Mogul nonsense, you know, if you mm. want another great ufological hoax. Uh, yeah. From the other side of the uh, other the side of the spectrum, and we had we had Charles Moore from Project Mogul, basically lying, and and we, we can document that now. Um, when the Mogul answer came about, um, I had gotten hold of the Winsloff data from from uh, 1947, and I supplied charts to. Um, Charles Moore. And in the original do document he did, he thanked me for giving him the charts. And I got a letter from him asking me for additional charts to create the Winds of Loft data. And at which he, he, I figured he was better at it than I would be. But the problem that it turned out to be was he modified the data. We've got a um, document. You know, when we got a hold of the document, we can thank the Air Force for this. They got a hold of Dr. Albert Crary's diaries and he filled those. He was the leader of the project in New Mexico where they were launching these balloon arrays. And he says the flight that they settled on for, for proving it was a mogul balloon was flight number four. But the documentation says the flight never flew. It was canceled. And yet we, you know, that kind of information was dribbling out. And, and Charles Moore insisted, well, no, we didn't really cancel the flight. It was launched earlier than the time we canceled it, and there was all this nonsense going on. And, and so, you know, we can look at it from both sides of the fence, you know, with the, the, the information dribbling out. So when Jerry says to me, or writes to me, communicates to me, that we need to kind of wait to get all the information, well, he's absolutely correct on that. But we can take a look at some of the stuff we do have and say, does this uh, hold up to... Um, and I, I was going to say disinterested scrutiny, but I, I, I think it's really not dis, it's not really din, disinformation. Um, it's not really disinterested scrutiny because I have a, a rooting interest in this sort of thing. So I'm a little bit biased on that. But look at the um, look at the case uh, in a dispassionate way. I'll, I'll drop another name here. I, when I was talking to James Van Allen, yeah, the radiation belt guy. Yeah. Um, I, we were talking about UFOs, and he said, you have to make your investigation dispassionate. You have to look at the evidence. You don't want, you know, we all have our biases when we come to an investigation, but you have to look at it in a dis dispassionate way. And I'll, I'll go on an, an anecdote here, which is kind of funny, because I asked him about UFOs, you know, believing in UFOs. And he says, well, when you're in the middle of Wyoming and you hear the thunder of hooves, you don't expect zebra. 
which means you have to eliminate the mundane before you move to the exotic. 20 years later, I saw a story uh, on the news about some zebra who'd escaped from a zoo in Wyoming. So you could be in Wyoming and hear the thunder of hoofbeats, and it could, in fact, be zebra. I thought it was just kind of coincidental that the, the analogy he had, he, had, he had provided me to came to truth in, in, uh, in, in Wyoming sometime later. Well, uh, thanks for the, uh, for the uh, donation, Bo. Uh, he said Grush testified for 11 hours to Congress. What do you think about that? The, they've had a lot of people testifying. Too, yes, and, and while while that is being said, just to let you know, I have a uh, let the audience know I have Mario Woods on who testified for four hours and nineteen minutes. He's going to be on next week as a special guest coming back on. But, but uh, we don't know yeah. what he testified to. We don't know what he said to Congress. We don't know any of that sort of thing. We don't know what information he provided to them. If he testified to con Congress and he was talking about the Italian UFO crash, well, then his testimony. Uh, becomes less critical you know if he's talking about stuff there's documents about this this italian ufo crash out there but they have been they, they haven't been properly vetted it's mj12 all over again uh, mj12 kind of thing all over again hmm. so we don't know what he said we don't we've we've seen uh, i i sat through the last um uh, meeting with uh, kirkpatrick to the senate on this, I watched his entire presentation, and I, I of course, uh, analyzed it on the blog. But nobody was really talking about UFOs. They were talking about the logistics of studying UFOs. They were mm -hmm. talking about a lot of stuff, uh, but we didn't get any meat. And then I watched the stupid NASA briefing that went on forever in a week. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it just went on endlessly, and we got nothing there. Mm -hmm. So you, you're looking at that. So he's testified to Congress for 11 hours, but we don't know what he said. We need the transcripts. We need to know what he said so we can take a look at the information. When they had the first briefing, the, the two guys from the Department of Navy, whose names escaped me because they were so inconsequential, I just refuse to remember them. But they were talking about how they had they'd seen nothing. It was the first, first briefing that they were given. Uh, they'd seen nothing. They presented a couple of useless videos and uh, talked around this whole thing. And one of the senators or one of the congressmen asked him about Maelstrom Air Force Base, where the missiles were shut down in 1968. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the guy actually said, well, we don't know anything about that. And later on, he admitted that he did know something about that. So, you know, was, was there a lie being told there? Was there some misrepresentation going there? But what struck me was at least one of the people questioning the witnesses knew a little bit about the topic. And uh, they kind of mealy mouth their way around that. But I think the Maelstrom thing is important because of um, the connection to UFOs. Because when the missiles were shut down at Maelstrom Air Force Base, there was also UFO sightings going on in the Belt, Montana area. And Maelstrom's in, in that area. Their, their missile fields are, what, over 100 square miles? I mean, scattered all over the Montana countryside. Um, and, and when uh, the Condon Committee uh, investigator went to Maelstrom to talk about this and asked about the missile shutdown, the um, UFO officers, I can't tell you about that. It's national security, which if you've got an outside force capable of shutting down the missiles, yeah, that's national security. I'll agree with that point. Yeah, I but, guess. Mm. but we don't know what he said during those 11 hours. And mm. we, we, we saw the interview on, is it News Nation? Yes. News Nation, because there, there's another new one called News Max. And yeah, it's like news, news Nation's fairly new. Yeah, so is News Max. Um, but, but the point is, we got no real details there other than him, uh, talking about this 1933 uh, uh, UFO crash. But we got no real details. We got nothing there. We don't know who he's talking to. We don't know what crashes he's talking about. You know, I speculate he may have been talking about Aztec. There's documentation, FBI documents, talking about the, the, the Aztec UFO crash for crying out loud. Um, there's that FBI memo that Hoover wrote in his handwriting um, talking about the, the it's probably the uh, Shreveport, Louisiana crash of uh, late uh, June of June or July of 1947. And, and Hoover writes, uh, but which, 
the, the, the military is asking the FBI for help in vetting the witnesses. And uh, Clyde Tolson put on the memo, yeah, we should do that. We should do that. And, and Hoover was agreeing with this. Yeah, but the Army has to um, agree to let us act, give us access to disc recovered in the, and it's SW, I think, SW case. Or, or I think it's the LA case. It, the, his writing is so bad, you can interpret it like 14 different ways. But he was referring to Shreveport. So we've got a document talking about a crash that you could interpret that says SW for Southwest, meaning the Roswell case, but it really doesn't mean that. But we've got all those kinds of problems. And we have to see the documents. We have to see the evidence. We have to know who he was talking to. We have to know, we have to cite the sources. And if you can't do that, then you're doing us no good. Right, right. Let me, uh, let's move on to this right here. I would like to talk about because this is uh, interesting, and I wanted to know what you thought about it. It's a uh, let me let me get over to the right page here. I can't get there. Let's see. Over here we go. Um, nope. I'm trying to scroll up on this thing. Here we go. All right. This was uh, released by George Knapp, and uh, this George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell. This is a Canadian document, and have you have read this over? What do you think? It really doesn't tell us anything. I know, it's, but it's, it's, it's the same kind. It's the same kind of thing we've seen time and time again. He refers to this uh, evidence from 1950. Is this the Wilbur Smith stuff that uh, Robert Saubacher was talking about two decades ago, a quarter of a century ago? Is that what he's referring to? It, there's nothing in there that really gets gives us any meat. It's some guy worried about the. Um, ramifications if the Canadian government is involved in the reverse engineering of these craft uh, with, with the Australians, the New Zealands, the um, Canadians, the British and the Americans. And so we've got this sort of thing, you read the document, but there's really no meat to it. It talks about this 1950 stuff. And I'm wondering, and, and if you have to remember, Wilbur Smith was a Canadian scientist Yes. Supposedly was involved, said something to Robert Saubacher, and Saubacher talked about that. But Smith was long gone before we got that information from Saubacher. And then it turns out Saubacher didn't see or hear anything himself. And so it's secondhand information. It doesn't do us any good. And reading that letter, he really doesn't give us any specifics. And it's not a classified letter anyway. Right. If there were specifics in it, that may have been classified at that point. But he's just saying, well, we need to he, the, he's urging the um, with the defense minister to um, take a look at this stuff just in case, because he doesn't want the uh, Canadian government to offend uh, their their partners in the um, in the world. Uh, we, of course, being Americans, one of those partners, I would want I would want us offend the Australians because they have all those nasty creatures that just can kill you in an instant. <laughs> <laughs> but now here's uh, the question I have, though, is why would this person, what would be the purpose to write this if it wasn't something of concern? Uh, yes, obviously it's something of concern, but we don't know what information he has to cause that concern other than what we all have at the moment. And that part of it was the whistleblower coming forward and getting this this uh, having multiple platforms to talk about this without information that we can get to. And he talks about this night that was caught my attention with his reference to the 1950 stuff. And I began to think, you know, what was going on in 1950? And I, that was the Wilbur Smith um, investigation. Wilbert, Wilbert Smith, right? Pardon me? Wilbert Smith. Wilbert. Nice. Yeah. Not Wilbur. Yeah. I mean, well, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The guy's dead, and we don't. Oh, no, I, yeah. Um, no, it's. It, my God, I have it written down on my note, Wilbur Smith, because <laughs> I didn't want to forget his name, and I've got it written down. <laughs> but but we got the information from Sabacher. Sabacher didn't know anything himself. Sabacher was talking about how the government was involved in this investigation and doing reverse engineering and all this stuff. And when you pin Sabacher down, I think Jerry Clark pinned him down. I think uh, Stan Friedman tried to pin him down. I think um, what William Steinman got the original uh, information from him, tried to pin him down. And, and, and so he was telling, well, he'd heard this stuff, he'd heard this stuff, but it turns out 
That's all. He didn't attend the meetings where the stuff was discussed. He wasn't in the meetings. He heard it from other people. So, so in essence, you know, it's secondhand at best, maybe thirdhand. Um, and, and a number of us investigators are in the same boat. I mean, we've talked to people who were there in the Roswell case. I, any number of people who were involved in the Roswell recovery, we've talked to. So we're now secondhand witnesses to that stuff which is not a way to add to my credibility, but to merely, merely point out that, that we have been able to uh, uh, talk to people who are involved on a you know, one-to-one basis. Uh, as an example, we've, we've got the Sheriff Wilcox in Roswell. Well, we never talked to him. We talked to his daughter. So when we talk to the daughter, that becomes, um, she was secondhand, we're thirdhand. But the daughter, um, Oh, I want it's not Elizabeth Tolk, it's the other one whose name I cannot remember at the moment. Geez, it's what happens when you get old, your brain melts. Yeah. <laughs> um, McGuire, McGuire. Um, she was in the office when Brazel showed up, so she could mm-hmm. talk about what she had seen in the office, yeah, and then other stuff she heard mm-hmm. later. But she would then she became second hand, she became first hand, and we talking to her, we became second hand witnesses, right? Um, but but. With Sabacher, he's at best a second-hand witness and maybe a third-hand witness. And it's and it's Wilbur Smith. Can't believe I wrote it down right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I worry that that's the reference, and he's gotten a hold of some of that old information that's come up, and we have to um, we have to we have to remember that sort of thing. But there's nothing in the letter that is a classified and really corroborates anything other than he's concerned that there might be reverse engineering going on. Nothing about really weaponization, but reverse engineering going on. And he's concerned that um, it will affect their relations with the other partners in this want to say triumvirate, but it's really more than that, but it's the Australians, the New Zealand's, the Canadians, the British and the United States all involved in this, um, this, ongoing research into other th- other things not just ufos so i think the the, the uh, purpose for the letter was to warn to, to to make sure that the proper government officials in canada are aware of this possibility yeah well um i just want to say uh toodaloo to everyone over at kgra radio um we're going to continue on a little bit because we have not talked about your book and that's the main reason you actually were here. So thank you over at KGRA Radio, and we'll see you next week uh, with Mario Woods. So um, this situation here, in your opinion, this is your opinion. Do you think that, um, I personally think that some people are gonna start, more people are gonna come forward. I know they have to have integrity. I've actually spoken to someone hopefully is going to be on my show that has uh, was in the military and had a situation happen that's related to this. And I'm, I'm really excited. I'm going to meet him face to face next week. And um, but I am hopeful that, well, first of all, I always I always had personally, I always thought it was very uh, when I first started hearing about crash vehicles, I thought, wow, that's, you know, bizarre. And I, I was saying kind of things that I heard other people say, um like they how did they get here and then how could they crash but if you had i'm asking you to speculate here do do you believe that it's possible that there are crashed vehicles and that we actually do like russia's story could be an actual truth there are elements that that i believe are true and we was talking about the roswell case well yeah as i said earlier, you know, I lean toward the extraterrestrial in the Roswell case. You know, people say to me, well, why would it crash? And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe somebody pushed the wrong button. Um, You know, maybe something failed. You Mm -hmm. know, Uh, I mean, we have moved to a point in our technology where things things can be built that are almost uh, indestructible. And yet, things still go wrong. So they crashed. I had, I'd said at one point, my favorite theory was that they did it on purpose. 
because it's a very non-threatening way to introduce themselves to the people of Earth. It's, you know, it's crash craft in the dead bodies. Well, there's speculation of Roswell being a lightning strike. Yeah. You, 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 you can get through inter interstellar space and a lightning bolt is going to bring you down. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stuff you got to get through in interstellar space to get here and lightning isn't going to be a problem. But I, you know, as I said, I, th th they did it on purpose and somebody thought I was serious. You know, <laughs> I just like it as a keen theory. It's not true, but it's the one I kind of like. Um, but, but I can't see them raining out of the sky. They're talking about the United States being in possession of 12. Or more. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And, and, and if we've got 12, do the Canadians have 12? How about the Russians and the Chinese? Yeah, as far as landmass goes, we're small landmass compared to Russia and China and that, you know. And there's interesting stuff going on in the United States with our with our rocketry and our atomic testing and all of that that would kind of draw their attention. But then again, you can say the same things about the Russians and the Chinese and, and other places on Earth. Um, you know, so you've got to take a look at all of that. But I just can't believe they're raining out of the sky in in that fashion. Um, I know that a lot of the cases um, that I've looked at, and I was at one point. I, I was thinking there was like 12, not 12, I was thinking there was a handful of cases, just, I mean, like five or six cases that were good evidence of some kind of crash. Roswell being one of them, Las Vegas being one of them, Kecksburg being one of them, there was Shag Harbor, which I think more of as an emergency landing than a, than a crash, and we never really recovered anything there. But you look at some of these cases and, and you think, okay, these make sense. But then we begin to get into it, and, and some of them just don't hold up under under proper scientific uh, investigation. I think I think the uh, Las Vegas crash is probably not a crash, but it was a, a meteor that exploded in the sky over Las Vegas. Hmm. You know, talking to the people in Las Vegas and talking to that. And they said, well, they tracked it on radar. Well, they really didn't. They tracked the ion trail, which is a different, different kettle of fish, um, hmm. that sort of thing. But um, you have to take a look at all of that sort of thing. So I, I just look at the um, of, of, the, of that sort of thing. So I don't know why they would crash. Uh, you know, something broke, somebody pushed the wrong button, somebody miscalculated, somebody made a mistake and brought the thing down. Um, yeah. I know Stan was a, was a fan of the two collided and one right. fell in San Augustine yeah. and one fell in Ro the Roswell area. And I'm thinking, yes. yeah, I've crossed interstellar space and I fly into another flying saucer. Yeah, that's that, that makes sense. Um, well... Yeah. But, but but you have to remember the, the planes of San Augustine is single witness. It's Barney Barnett. That's it. And you say, well, we talked about uh, the rumors about that geological team from college stumbling across it. Was that was that proven a hoax? We never found them. Hmm. We never found them. Gerald Anderson said, well, they were from um, he, he identified the leader of the team as Adrian Buskirk. Turned out it was a high school anthropology teacher. Hmm. which he thought was dead, but we managed to find him alive and chatted with him. I chatted with him a number of times uh, and proved that Anderson was in his class and Stan denied it until the very end that Anderson wasn't in the anthropology class, but Stan knew the truth because I got the letter showing it. Hmm. But, but um, it really boiled down to Barney Barnett and it was people he told this story to. And when more was doing his, Bill Moore was doing his original investigation of the Roswell case. He talked to a guy named Fleck Danley, who was um, Barnett's boss in 1947, and got him to say that it, well, I think it was the summer of 1947. When I talked to Fleck Danley, he really didn't have any idea when it was. You know, he, he said to me, well, it was the summer of 1947, and in talking to him, I figured I could have convinced him it was uh, just last week. Um, so we have, we have to take a look at all of that sort of stuff. But Roswell, Roswell, I think, is the best example we have of, of a UFO crash. And it explains an awful lot of the way the um, government reacted in later years and the reason they were um, so panicked with just the idea that the, um, uh, um, they didn't know what the UFOs were. They know what the flying saucers were. Were they Soviet? Were they somebody else's? Uh, what exactly were they, and if they and if they found the remnants of one, 
they would have reacted with the, the secrecy they did simply because uh, we are now have in our possession a technology that far superior to anything we have. And if we can figure it out, we're going to move way ahead of our competitors in the world. And, and you know, as I said, um, I, I saw the question flash up there. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was that was the idea with uh, I said earlier that they had done yeah. it on purpose. You sort of did. Yes. To, that was this question here. But I don't. I don't think. I don't think that. I think it was a mistake. I think it was a, a legitimate accident, as opposed to something they had done on purpose. Because if they had done it on purpose, they wouldn't have picked Roswell. They wouldn't. Have, they wouldn't have picked a ranch seventy-five miles or sixty-five miles northwest of Roswell in the barren desert, where somebody may not find it for literally years. They would have picked some place where it could have gotten the public play that they wanted. If that was the purpose behind it, you know, what, why are we going to? Why we going to? crash this thing to announce our presence here in a non-threatening benevolent way um hmm. and they, they picked a place why not crash i was gonna say crash at white sands but that wouldn't have done them any good because the military would have had it and hushed the whole thing up but some place where uh the the media could have gotten to it the scientists could have gotten to it that they, they wouldn't have been able to contain it as well as they did yeah but you're thinking of you're thinking in human intelligence that's something we always tend to do and we don't know the way whatever it is thinks well but we can we can speculate to a point by saying well they're all sentient beings and there are certain logical things that would come about you know we can say well they wouldn't be using base 10 for the numbering system <laughs> uh well, if, we, if we go by if we go by the alien autopsy film they would have done what base eight yeah. So do you know about Gerald Anderson? I know all about Gerald Anderson. All right. What do you want to know about Gerald Anderson? Uh, yeah. What about Gerald Anderson? Oh, Gordon, Gordon Shumway, my butt. Alf breath. Yep. <laughs> Gordon Shumway was Alf on the uh, the show on TV. Oh. Alf's name, real name was Gordon Shumway. Uh, proving <laughs> I pay attention to science fiction, too. Gerald Anderson uh, interjected himself into the Roswell crash and uh, talked about how he had, uh, he and his uh, father and his uncle and brother or something um, were out looking for, originally out for Moss Agate on the plains of San Augustine when they found the crash. Uh, we actually talked, I actually talked to a geologist and learned more about where you could find various agates uh, in New Mexico. And Moss Agate wasn't found on the plains of San Augustine, but you could find banded agate. So his story then became, well, they were looking for Moss Agate and banded agate, which is a real red flag, meaning you're changing your story to incorporate the new information. Anderson talked about how it was a guy named Adrian Buskirk. Tom Carey did some research and found a Buskirk, who's an anthropologist, and discovered that it was Winfred Buskirk. Um, and he was, we learned that he was, he had taught at the Albuquerque High School. And I was trying to figure out a connection between uh, um, Winfred Buskirk and Anderson. Um, learned they were both in New Mexico and then realized that uh, Anderson had been at the Albuquerque um, High School. Uh, Buskirk had friends there look up his records and told us, and, and they told me, I, I talked to him as well, that uh, Anderson had taken the anthropology course from Buskirk. And they knew it was Buskirk's anthropology course because he was the only one that taught anthropology courses at the Albuquerque High School in the time frame. And if he took anthropology, he didn't uh, he had to take it from Buskirk. Uh, so he knew Buskirk from that time. So he just, he just put his high school anthropology teacher into this crash retrieval. Well, Buskirk told me that in July, of 1947, he was in Arizona uh, doing his PhD, working on his PhD dissertation with the uh, Western Apache. Uh, Anderson produced a identikit sketch of this guy. Now remember, Anderson's five years old at the time, and now he's giving us, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 years later, he's giving us an identikit sketch of what this guy looked like. And these were circulated in New Mexico. One of the people found them, found one of them and said, oh, look, it's Wynn Buskirk. I mean, recognized it from the identikit sketch. We um, learned that in 1947, Buskirk didn't look like that. He was much thinner. And so what 
uh, the 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 um, identikit sketch was Buskirk in 1957, and you could match the pictures from the yearbooks. We got the uh, I should say Tom Carey got pictures of Buskirk, and we put all of that together. So we knew Buskirk couldn't be the guy. Anderson said that um, there was this big battalion-sized operation going on over at Horse Springs. They were lining aircraft on the on the roads and all of this stuff. There was a guy named um, Wesley Hurt, Dr. Wesley Hurt from Harvard or Harvard. Uh, yeah. On the plains of San Augustine in July. We didn't know exactly when. I think it was Art Campbell found a letter in the Harvard archives dated July for, uh, uh, dated in July. Says, and, and Hurt says, we arrived on July 1st. So we knew when he got there. So he would have been there at the time of the crash. I told this to Stan Friedman. And Stan says, they were working at a place called Bat Cave, which I'm always hesitant to say because it's Bat Cave. Well, it's a cave full of bats, obviously. Yeah. In the in the mountains on the um, eastern bank of what was the plains of San Augustine. The plains of San Augustine is dried up lake bed. And I, I mentioned that the Stan says, well, we don't know uh, how far they were in the cave. We don't know which way the cave faced, anything like that. And I said, well, I do, Stan. They were looking for human habitation, so they wouldn't have been very deep in the cave because without flashlights or torches, you couldn't go very deep into the cave because um, it would get really, really dark. And the case, cave was oriented, so the mouth of the cave faced to the west, so we could have seen there. And the only camping site was a, play, a flat, flat place about 100 yards from, this, from the opening of the cave. So they were there at the time from July 1st uh, through when the crash supposedly took place, when all this operation went on and then they left i talked to wesley hurt and he said we didn't see anything like that and hurt said in a letter to me that he was not a fan of the government and if he knew anything he'd tell me um tom found um a guy named danson ted danson's father was a anthropologist or an archaeologist he was with him um and there was a guy named herbert dick and I always, when I was writing out these places, I would always, when I listed the names, it would always be, I'd always say, Hurt, Dick, Danson, uh, just for the pure insanity of having some fun. <laughs> but we were able to demonstrate that, that Anderson's story was untrue. And um, there was other things, there's a lot of other things going on. Honey produced a, a diary supposedly kept by his aunt, but the ink was from 1974. So it couldn't have been her that had done it because she had been killed or his an uncle had done it and he'd been killed. He, uh, to make me look bad, produced a phone bill showing that he'd only talked to me for 26 minutes on the phone call. I got a hold of the regular bill because it had my phone number on it. So Southwestern Bell actually sent me a copy. And I so I had a legitimate copy signed by the people at uh, uh, Southwestern Bell, showing that my phone call was for 54 minutes. I have mm -hmm. a tape of the conversation. Um, when we asked about the, um, as we got in the conversation, I started feeding lines because I knew this guy was full of um, blueberry muffins. I take that from the um, uh, the thing from another world movie. If you're stuffed completely full of blueberry muffins. Anyway, <laughs> You know, uh, I, had, you know, I had asked him questions about this, and he said at one point that the alien eyes were mil uh, were, were uh, a, a milky blue, a very light blue. And I was in the, it, coincidentally, I was in the bookstore in Roswell, New Mexico, and they had um, one of Whitley Strieber's books on, uh, remain, on the remainder pile, hardback books. And it had a picture of the alien with milky blue eyes. So I knew where Anderson got the milky blue eyes. Mm. Uh, when we called him on that, or others called him on that, he said that um, they were murky blue. What he said was murky blue. No, he said milky blue, and I got you on tape, pal. Huh? I got you on tape for 54 minutes um, and that sort of thing. But the, the whole point of this, there was so much wrong with the Anderson story, we were able to eliminate it completely and totally. We, we, we found his anthropology teacher who he identified as being on the pl plains of San Augustine when he was not. We... Uh, learned that the, the excuse for being there was not right. We learned that he changed his story when uh, you look at it. It went from, I think there were two dead aliens. One was injured and one was 
okay to three dead aliens and all kinds of other stuff going on. So, I mean, he just, he changed the story. He couldn't remember what he told us from one, one story to another. Finally admitted that he forged the phone bill to make me look bad. And I'm thinking, well, that's a pretty good um, indication that he can't be trusted. So I actually uh, went on the radio as this whole thing was developing in the mid 1990s, calling Anderson a, um, a liar, hoping he would sue me because then I could subpoena the records from the high school oh. to prove that he had taken the anthropology course when he had denied it. He showed up a, a um, supposedly a transcript that showed he didn't take the anthropology course, but um, it was clearly it had been, it had been modified. So oh. there you go. Wow. That's something. So we have to move on to your, cause we, we, uh, we went over time, which is good. I'm enjoying the conversation. But uh, here is your latest book, and this is a uh, updated version with all kinds of extras. Something that you wrote originally back in two thousand, was yes, it? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Well, well, first of all, it's really not my latest book. Um, I think oh, okay. my well, latest the one. It's the one that Philip Mantle contacted me about. Uh, so let's talk about your latest book. Then. Well, the, uh, Understanding Roswell came out after that. And the latest one is called 1973. And it deals with the, the UFO settings in 1973. And I always think of it as a companion book to some of the things Philip is doing with um, um, Char uh, 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 not Hickson Parker, Cal Calvin Parker, who's a very nice guy. And I you know chatted with him a number of times. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the, the Washington National book was updated with uh, new information. It talks about the um, basically the summer of 1952, the UFO sightings over Washington, D.C. Um, well, now I'm looking for your latest book. So that was the book that uh, that Philip uh, told me to to push. <laughs> so what's the name of your latest book? I think the latest one from from um, Philip is Understanding Roswell. Okay. Um, the the 1973 book about the the sightings from 1973 will be coming out in the fall. Um, there it is here. Well, yeah. that's you can get it in audio books, and you can get it on Kindle. You can get a, a nice hardback copy, which are really really expensive, and I actually paid to get one because I thought it was cool. <laughs> oh yeah, and you have to sign it too. Sign your own book. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but but like I said, it, it deals it deals uh, well. The Roswell book deals with um, a lot of the stuff that's kind of overlooked in, in the Roswell investigation, and kind of weeds out some of the things that got have gone awry in the investigations. Um, I've always said that every member of Colonel Blanchard's staff we were able to talk to uh, about this, with one exception, said it was extraterrestrial, hmm. uh, and that one one exception is a guy named Barrowclaw. And he was, I don't remember whether he was the executive officer or the deputy commander. He was one of the, he was, he was either the number two or the number three guy at Roswell. And he said, no, it wasn't true. But everybody else we talked to said, yeah, it happened. Um, uh, and, and it was extraterrestrial. Edwin Easley, who was a provost marshal, and for those of you who don't understand provost marshal, it's like the chief of police. Um, provost marshal is the military guy. And mm. talking to him, he would have been responsible for security and, and knew what was going on. And I asked him at one point, are we following the right path? And he said, well, let me put it this way. It's not the wrong path, meaning, of course, it's extraterrestrial. So, I mean, here's, mm. the, here's the guy who's responsible for security. Um, but we looked, I looked at all of that stuff in the Roswell case. I, I looked at the histories of some of the guys that I could find. Um, one of the guys, I think it was Payne, uh, he, uh, he was killed in the Korean War. They were testing some kind of big, hairy-ass bomb. Uh, and it detonated prematurely mm. uh, and blew up the aircraft. Wow. And he was killed in that. One of the guys, the story was one of them had disappeared into the Bermuda Triangle. It turns out, well, that's not quite right. Um, they were transferring a bunch of guys. I think, I think it was, uh, I don't remember which guy it is now, but they were transferring a bunch of guys from Roswell to a base in England, and the plane went down in the Atlantic Ocean. And a lot of the people survived the crash and there was a plane circling overhead for a while and he had to leave. And by the time the um, rescue ships got there, everything was gone. They couldn't find anybody, couldn't find anything. But it was a good six or 700 miles from the Bermuda Triangle. So it had nothing to do with the Bermuda Triangle, it was just an aircraft accident. Hmm. Um, 
So, you know, it, it looks at that sort of thing. It looks at depth. Again, I think it talks about the project mogul nonsense. It talks about some of the witnesses who have come forward that we believe um, are credible and gives yeah. you a, a, a sort of a different perspective in, into the Roswell case. And if you, and if you put it together with uh, Roswell in the 21st century, you get a, 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 a a much larger picture of the in-depth of research that's gone on. I, I mean, um, the the in, uh, Philip Philip doesn't like footnotes, so um, in understanding Roswell, I had to put the sources kind of in the text. But in in Roswell in the twenty first century, I think there's like a thousand footnotes. So you know, you get the sources, you understand where the information came from, you understand how we collected it, we understand why we believed it. Uh, one of the examples is um, Frank Joyce, who was a radio station guy in Roswell, at KGFL in 1947, talked about his meeting with Brazel in the station on the Wednesday after the uh, story came out that the uh, it was um, a weather balloon. And um, Brazel's talking to Joyce in the radio station, and they, he, Brazel's getting the new weather balloon story. And he's, as he's leaving, Brazel supposedly turned to Joyce and said, well, you know how they talk about little green men? Well, they weren't green. And then he leaves. So the question becomes, when did the idea of little green men enter the lexicon? You know, would Brazel have said something like that in 1947? And so there's a long footnote that explains the evolution of the idea of the little green men. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of the kind of research we engaged in trying to learn exactly what, what was going on. And we discovered that the idea of little green men goes back into um, actually mythology. Um, and the, the green men were the forest dwellers in England, I think it was. And then it uh, evolved into the aliens. Uh, John Carter on Mars, the Edgar Rice Burroughs um, series that began with Princess of Mars in 1913 had a race of green men on Mars, for example. Huh. There was a Popeye cartoon in 1938 where the alien creatures are green. So it was something that had been in the lexicon for a um, long, long time. Uh, did yeah. I include the Al Chop description of the UFO? Do you I know, talk, you I know talk, what that is? Pardon me? I don't understand that. what that means. Do you know what that Al means? Chop, Al Chop was the uh, Pentagon spokesman for UFOs in, the, in 1952. I see. And I talked mm -hmm. to Al Chop. And here's an interesting thing. I was talking to Al Chop, and we were talking about the movie UFO, because Al Chop is in the movie. I mean, not him personally, but he's represented as a character in the movie, UFO. And I was talking to him, and he said, well, you know, he hadn't seen the movie in a long time. And he said, would you like a copy of it? So I had a videotape. And he said, yes, yeah. so I sent him a copy of UFO. But I, I, talked to, I talked to him. Chop never really described UFOs to me. He talked about what went on in the radar room at, at the Pentagon on the second second Saturday night, he and both Dewey Fournay were in the radio, or the radar room, I'm sorry, the radar room when the, the intercepts took place. And so they were describing what they were seeing on the radar scopes and how that related to the attempted intercepts and what other people were saying, seeing on the ground. They had called, um, they were talking to airline pilots trying to get them to, can you see a light? There should be a light out at this location. And at one point uh, in the intercept, uh, the, the UFO sort of surrounded the fighter plane um, and that sort of thing. Both Chop and Chop, I, I don't remember which one it was. One of them was mentioned something, you know, got really hairy. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, I think he used the word gruesome. And he said, well, I can't tell you that. And, and I was talking to the other one, and I don't remember which was which. And I said, you know, I'll Chop or do it for me. Tell me about the one one that got really gruesome. He said, oh, yeah, it's a fighter plane got just surrounded by the UFO. So he figured I already knew about it, so he told me about it. Hmm. But, but um, you know, Chop, I, do, I did talk to Chop uh, about this. I talked to Dewey Fournay about this. Um, I, I, you know, I had access to the Air Force records. I had access to an uh, interview with one of the fighter pilots that was uh, involved in the intercepts and talked to an awful lot of people about that. Talked to people out in the Northwest about the sightings that took place on, over the July 4th weekend, 19. Oh, that was 1947. Keep getting my dates mixed up. Didn't talk to the talk to other people, <laughs> people all over the place. Yeah, it's it's um, um, a very very interesting story. I think the Washington Nationals are a very important case. 
uh, because of the radar confirmation, the number of witnesses involved. Talk to I talked to some people who were uh, um, in, in sort of forced to change their stories hmm. after, after it came out. Military people who were involved and saw things and then changed their story. You know, the original story was this, and then they changed the story later uh, under pressure. I think so. How about that. Well, we, we, we can look at any number of sightings cases where that has happened. Hmm. So it, it's nothing that uh, that extraordinary. Um, was it? Um, I just had one in my mind that was just really, really uh, a good example of that. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the sheriff sheriff uh, uh, at Level Land will wear Clem. Always hated that name. Um, Prior to the Air Force investigator arrived, Clem was talking about how he had seen the object close, fairly close. It was oval shaped and bright red. After the Air Force investigator got there, well, I just saw a streak of light, um, you know, 900 yards away. I didn't really see much of a thing. It was in sight for two seconds. Later, he told Don Berliner and got back to the, well, this is what I really saw type thing. So we, but we have him talking about what he'd seen prior to the Air Force getting there. Once the Air Force left, he had changed his story to something that was... Yeah. Different. I, I outlined all that in a book called um, Encounter in the Desert, which is, no, I'm sorry, I'm not called, called Level Land. Good. Mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. I got to stop writing books. I can't keep them track. There are so many. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a good night. We've had a, a decent long conversation and uh, I wish you luck with your book. I'm going to put both links uh, since I already have that one link in there. I'll put both links of both books in there. Okay. Um, or maybe directly to your uh, all your books on Amazon. Well, well the, the, the books, uh, you go to Amazon and type my name in it, and yeah. the books will come up. If you type in Eric Helm, you'll find a lot of action-adventure books I wrote. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, it's been great, Kevin. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate I enjoy the conversations. Yes. Same here as always. Okay. All right. you, you take care. You too. All right. Good night. Good night. All right. So everyone will be back next week, as I mentioned, with Mario Woods. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.